Hey guys, it's Phil coming at you with another video. I apologize for the delay in my upload, but I had a lot going on and I just completed my last lecture at U of M for the semester, so I'll have a lot more time on my hands. So I'll be doing more frequent uploads. And in the meantime, 26 people kicked the exam in the chest and got the licensure and they are as follows. Eileen P, EDH, Cynthia V, Catherine A, Andre S, Andrea L, Michelle S, Shamil B, Donald C, Darla M, Amber B, Jess G, Cassandra T, Shyla M, Justin C, Alexandra A, Cynthia K, Amy H, Ryla C, Aaliyah R, Abani W, Venetia D, Emily F, Cindy S, Danielle G, and Amanda W. Ah! Congrats to those people, and if you want me to read your name as well, send me an email at berda24 at gmail.com, because that's how I track how many people have passed the exam and I think we're creeping up on our 500 mark so we might be doing something special when that happens which is mind-blowing because if you guys have been following me for a little while the goal at the beginning of the year was 100 and then it was 250 and then someone said dude you should shoot for 500 I didn't think it was gonna be possible at all but we're there but something I've been hearing a lot about in my email as well as in my question and answer of the study groups that I do is Phil all of these people around me want me to pass this exam. There's a lot of pressure. I could lose my job and all of these things. And what keeps going on in my mind, and I, I keep saying the same thing, so I wanted to bring it to you guys, is do you actually want this? Is this something you want or is this something that other people want you to want? So you're just working towards a goal that's not even yours. And if you are adding that pressure and you don't want this, you should want this goal more than the people around you want it. And if that's not you, just be honest with yourself and say, this might not be my goal right now. Or I need to tell the people around me to stop putting as more pressure on me than I'm putting on myself. Because if it's this is not your goal, just be honest and let it go. And if that's beyond the exam, if that's anything in your life, if you're working towards something and you're feeling burnt out, unmotivated or anything like this, and people around you are pushing you more than you're pushing yourself, let it go. This isn't your goal. This isn't something that you actually want. Because if it's something you want, yes, you're going to have times where you're very unmotivated. This, there are going to be times that you're not going to have that 100% fire. But if at the end of the day you don't have periods of where you want it so bad that you'd rather die than not get it, then it's not your goal. And if that's the case, then just let it go and let something else take its place and work towards something at this time that you actually want. Because if you're not investing your time and putting your focus in things that you actually want, you are going to feel burnt out. You are going to feel unmotivated. You're going to feel like it is the absolute worst thing in this world to work towards. Because if it's your goal, the pleasure of starting needs to be greater than the pleasure of actually finishing it because you're ticked off that you're not able to do this task any longer. And it may sound pretty difficult to, well, I do want that goal. You want the job that comes with completing this, but if you're not enjoying this process right now in order to get you to there, it's not actually what you want. So you need to get yourself focused and happy to actually study and do these things as of right now. And if that's not where you're at, that's okay, but refocus and reanalyze and be honest with yourself of what you want at this given time and not take away from where you could potentially be working because you're robbing yourself of actual potential and putting your energy in the wrong things. Because not all good things are good things and not all energy that we spend is spent in the best way possible and that's okay because we're humans and we don't have a pre-written script. But please do yourself the due diligence and reflect and be honest and say, what do I actually want right now and why am I unmotivated? Am I putting too much energy into this area and not enough into the areas that I actually want to spend it in? Because again, there's going to be sacrifice in anything, but if you're sacrificing too much and not giving back to yourself of what you actually want to do, that's an issue. But I definitely wanted to address that and share that out with you guys. And if you're interested in the study groups that I have, they are as follows. 11.3, DSM-5 and meds. 11.10, client interventions. 11.17, human developmental theories. And 11.24, ethics review. So if you're interested in any of the study groups or have any questions for me, my email is berda24 at gmail.com. And this video is going to be me interacting with people that have been struggling with the exam and me providing practical solutions to their situations, as well as I review research topics and put it in a very basic term, as well as provide motivation along the way. And again, if you want to connect with me or get, attend any of my study groups, my email is berda24 24 at gmail.com and from the bottom of my heart guys i appreciate everything and all the support you guys share my names and everything 
Take care, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Sit back and relax and enjoy this video. Peace out, guys. Okay, so go ahead. Okay, so um, this is my first time taking my test, and I take it Thursday. Um, my, because um, I've been watching videos and you say don't use a lot of things, use what works for you. I've been using your videos, um, your study group, and um, APGAR, the book, and the pocket prop. Um, for pocket prop, I've been making um, on quizzes um, between like 60 and 80 and on the quizzes. And I'm comfortable with that because I'm not striving for perfection, I'm striving for passing. Mm -hmm. And um, I've got a routine on how I want to answer my questions. And I'm taking a day off before the test um, to study more, but kind of do some self-care away from the office. So I'm not stressing out about office things before my test. Is that doing too much or kind of like sound reasoning? Walk me through this. What makes you think that's too much? Um, because some people are like, I didn't take off. I'm listening behind other friends who are already passed. I didn't take off for um, I, and then I've also heard I don't study enough, which doing about 15 to 20 hours a week, which was my goal, and I'm not cramming. Mm -hmm. I'll do like an hour in the morning and a couple hours at night on some days or one hour at night, one hour in the morning, and more on the weekend. Okay. So with that, one big thing is you don't want to listen to other people that aren't making you feel more confident in your abilities. So if somebody's telling you you're studying too much or too little, again, focus on what you think is best for you and stay with that. Because people are often speaking from their experiences rather than what is actually like valid for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I wouldn't say it's too much at all. I would say if you're comfortable with it and you aren't feeling burnt out and amped up around it, I would stick with it and take care of what you need to do. Yeah, I thought like I'm going to take the day off, do a little studying. I'm not going to cram, but I just need to take self-care because if I was at the office today, I would put my and I would probably like some crisis would happen and like my whole key would get blown. So... And so I would say, I'd say that you have a good plan and just carry it out because yes, work is one of the biggest reasons that people will feel pressure outside of what they should be doing, whether it's the expectations from the job or I had a crisis right before the day of my exam, I didn't have time to wind down and now I feel stressed and didn't sleep well and now I walk into the exam not in the best condition I possibly could have been in. Okay, I feel better. Like, like this week, I kind of have like some other like self care things before the test too. But like winter's gonna be the biggest one. Just like kind of get my focus in the right frame of mind. So, what are some things that you have planned to, for your self care? Okay, does that sound weird? Um. I do fire performance. So Monday, a bunch of my friends are spinning fire with me. Okay. No, that's cool. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's weird at all. Because if it recharges you and makes you feel good, there's zero judgment. Yeah. So now, if like, you're setting people's houses on fire, we have a different story. Oh, no, I'm, not pyro <laughs> I'm a healthy pyromaniac. <laughs> but we're doing that, and going to some workout times that I've not been able to get into and um, mostly having a moment to just sit and just be <laughs> just in space without worrying about uh, a client crisis or a co-worker crisis or a family crisis for a moment and just worry about this test. You have everything that you need. You just need to bring it in and carry out the plan without any judgment from anyone else or any perceived judgment of what you've done is not enough because we can't go back and redo something 
we can just be proud of what we've done and carry out the rest of the plan. Okay. You can do this. <laughs> I, I want to come back to the next free group and tell my story, so that's my plan. I will have you gladly. <laughs> I honestly will. All right, so thank you so much. Good luck and take care of business. Okay, hi, Phil. <laughs> How is it going? Welcome back. Yes, it's going good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to, you know, share my experience and and just hopefully, honestly, and Chelsea, I, hopefully my story will, will help you because what you're doing right now is exactly what I did. So hopefully I can, you know, spread some encouragement and just, you know, let everybody know that it's, this is going to be okay. <laughs> um, so let me, should I just, you know, tell my story or cut me off in five minutes? Like you let me know. Go ahead. So okay. say what, like why I'm having you come back. Okay, great. Okay. okay, guys. So my name is Dr. Kia Renee and I passed my LMSW exam August 12th, 2019. It's very, very exciting. Um, moment in 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 my life, like <laughs> literally, it was the most exciting moment. Besides, you know, getting my doctor, it just felt like the completion of my um, um, academic career onto you know my next move for my career. So I guess just a quick overview. I took the test one time before back in 2015. Very very negative experience, and that was all my fault. Um, I was like, he had bad anxiety. Kia, you don't like time tests. I used so many different study methods. My head was studying books, printed out everything, had a tutor, um, Bryn Mawr, um prep course. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that in Pennsylvania, but I took that, studied nonstop, I think about two and a half to three months, and I failed the test. So I was only by a couple of points, but you couldn't tell me that because it felt like by 20 points. I was so devastated. I said, I don't want to do it. I don't need it. I'm going to get my degree and I'm going to just move on with my life. <laughs> that was my thought. But, you know, after I graduated, I started getting the itch, you know, key, you, I think you might want your uh, license. So end of May, no, end of June is when I found Phil. And that was through, again, me first just trying to see what was going on. Like, hey, I can take it in a couple, uh, about four years. And I knew the year I took it, they was just about to go over to the up, um, updated DSM. So I really was like, oh man, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to get the new book. I'm not even gonna know what the changes are. So I really was a little nervous. So I wanted to just see what was going on. So I got into all these Facebook groups and realized there was so many different things out there. I didn't know where to start, what to do. I heard about Dawn's book which um, a friend of mine's worked with her in the university she works at. So she definitely told me whenever I did want it again. And a couple of people who have their PhD in DSW recommended me to get it if I wanted to, you know, pursue that, that in my career. So that's what encouraged me to still pursue my license. So I got Dawn's book. I knew that's what I was going to read. In my mind, I only wanted two methods, maybe one, because I had so many different ones prior. So I got the book looked and seen, you know, what was going on, read all the different comments and posts in the uh, study groups, but that's how I came across Phil's name. Saw his YouTube videos, absolutely felt like, man, you know, this was a different way of learning. This was something new that I did not incorporate before. So I was like, let me, let me check him out. Then, then, the, then the story is over. <laughs> because after Phil, I just felt like I needed exactly what I was missing from his videos, from his encouragement, and, and the way I studied moving forward definitely changed. So a couple of things that I did, and definitely some key things that will stay with me throughout my entire academic, you know, career and, and everything, because Phil really dropped some knowledge, not just for this exam, but just throughout life. Um, so I used Don's book. I read, you know, probably a chapter a day, tried to spread it out, did Phil's videos, during the week and definitely his study sessions on Sunday. One of the things that really made me stick with Phil was because I still was thinking about all those negative things on top of the new negative things. Like, Kia, why didn't you do it in 90 days? Kia, I can't believe you didn't, you know, you only failed it by a couple of points. So I was still hard on myself thinking I was still back in 2015. 
one of the things that Phil said that really dawned on me was, even though, you know, you're going in for the exam again, it's not the same test. So don't think about what you did before. Or don't think about the test before. Think, you know, clean slate, you're going in, you're taking a new test. That absolutely helped me because I just erased the anxiety that I had about the way I did it and how I did it before and how hard I was on myself before, which was the next key thing that Phil constantly said, if anybody's been with me for a while, positive <clears throat> thoughts generate positive outcomes. I was so negative, negative on myself um, and reflecting on everything that I went through. I wasn't encouraging myself. I kept, you know, kid, you don't like tests. Kid, oh my gosh, the clock ticking in the corner. You always failed in high school. Like I was just going back, you know, thinking of all the things that I never accomplished when it came to a test with this license exam. So he really, you know, jammed that in my brain and I took that and moved forward. So a little thing I came up with, and I said it to myself all the time during the exam, all, every moment that I could, Kia, you know it, so you could do it. Like, Kia, you know it, so you could do it. Like, and I would just tell myself that. So it's something as simple as that or whatever encouraging thing that you might have or posted or whatever, keep that near you during those, you know, stressful, anxiety-filled moments because it just really alleviated that for me and allowed me to move on. So anyway, so basically... Um, those main two things, Phil, you know, contributed to me, realize this is a new test and realize that you need to think positive so you can have a positive outcome. Because in my mind, I actually left a really bad job. So Chelsea, when you said that you took off the day before, so, you know, any stress that job may have given, you wouldn't even have to worry about it. My job was so stressful. I just already knew whatever I was doing forward, I wouldn't be able to do that at this job. So I gave myself a time frame to do this and to accomplish it so I could open up more doors with the credentials behind my name. So I gave myself, I found the end of June. So I gave myself probably until August. Well, obviously August. So a couple, so a month or two, I probably uh, two months, maybe a month and a half of studying. I said I was going to dedicate that time. And that's what it was going to be about. Now, you would think that I was studying probably eight hours a day, working from home. I did some consulting on the side, but honestly, I only studied a couple hours a day. And that's because, again, Phil said, be, you know, make sure what you're studying sticks with you. Like, be uh, effective and efficient with what you're doing because you don't have to jam, you know, eight hours or feel like you need a certain time frame to do what you got to do. As long as you're retaining it, you know, that, that was the best, best thing for you. Another thing that he said was, how do you learn? Again, I read books and I, my head was stuck in books the previous time. He said, add in visual, add in audio. And again, if, if you've been with him for a while, you heard about the voice memo. I recorded myself with, with everything. Again, little pieces from the book and definitely pieces from his Word documents. And, you know, I played them while driving. I played them while shopping, you know, in the market. And I started talking with it as if it was my favorite song. So that was definitely an element that definitely helped me because it allowed me just to bring it to memory without having a book in front of my face. So that definitely helped. And so again, two hours, a couple of hours a day. And I had two days of break. Like, you know, I incorporated these things because I didn't before. So having Saturday and Monday as my study breaks, no studying those days, I felt efficient in what I did because Sunday I found a study partner, again, through Phil's sessions. We did about two, three hours Sunday morning. I did my little in-between studying on my own. And then 7 o'clock, you know, until 10, 30, 11, I was with Phil doing a session. So Sunday was like my power day. So I felt confident having a couple of hours, you know, maybe two or three during the week because I did so much, you know, on Sunday, I felt good just to reinforce it throughout the week. So, so yeah, so I did that. Um, one of the other things that I did was do the practice exam, which I did not do back in 2015. And I did that because previously I, I, I fell by a couple points, but I had 70 questions left with 30 minutes. So I, again, because my, I'm reading too much and I reading too, you know, deep into the question, maybe I need to go back. I checked off every single question it feels like because I had everything marked that I needed to go back and review. Didn't have time to do that. So the stress of it in 2015 was bad. I said, I can't do that again. Again, thinking positively. 
Kia, you need to practice. You need to practice. I heard people took a break. I was like, what? People took breaks during this test? So I incorporated a break. I incorporated time at the end of the test to have in order to go back and uh, review anything that I marked. And again, what Phil said, don't change no answers. Do not, do not, do not, do not. And again, if I knew what I knew, I was confident. I didn't even look at those questions. If I didn't know, if I knew what I didn't know, I also did not change those questions. Because again, as much as we want to think, like let's study every single thing, it still might be that one or two questions like, oh my gosh, I, I didn't even touch, you know, that topic. So you have to go, you know, with the most, uh, you know, logical answer and just move on. So I allowed myself to have at least like 45 minutes at the end of the test to, again, calmly go through my questions, calmly make sure I'm checking everything, do not change any answers. And I mean, lo and behold, I did the survey and it said, congratulations, you passed the test. And I mean, it was amazing feeling because I was so positive about it. And honestly, and Phil will tell you guys, I was stressed about not stressing. And, 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 you know, stress sometimes comes natural if we're doing something, you know, to this extent. And with all the different reasons to stress because of this exam, it's, it's, it's normal. But I guess I was, you know, again, again, as we all do listen to other people's story, I'm like, well, maybe I'm not studying enough. Kia, why are you so comfortable only studying two to three hours? And then Phil was like, you're, you're just creating, <laughs> you're just creating something out of nothing. And again, I guess it's a natural habit. If I'm not stressing about this, I'm gonna find something to stress about because I need to do it during this 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 most you know monumental moment of my social work career. So he told me to relax. My test was Monday the 12th. He said, "Do not come to my session on the 11th." He said, "Do not read Dawn's book again because I I had a whole week." I said, I, "I'm not gonna see you for a week, and and I shouldn't read the book again." He said, "Do what you need to do." but I wouldn't advise that. So I didn't do that. I did not do that at all. I probably just, I took Dawn's exam in the back of her book, passed that, and then I took the ASWV exam and I was good for that. So during that last week, I might've just did a couple of questions here and there throughout each day, you know, ended up doing all 170 by Friday and just, you know, went into the book, like question 25, I had page 54 highlighted. So I might've just reflected with Dawn's book in that way connected each question to the page number. So if I did feel myself a little caught up, I was able just to go directly to that page and just read that paragraph to confirm my thoughts, you know, or check my, check um, the answers that I chose. Um, so then the day before, Sunday, Chelsea again, self-care. You, so you did everything that, that you're thinking about, everything that I did. I, you know, I, I forgot what I did. Actually, it's a blur. But I know I didn't touch no material. I was relaxed. Got up Monday morning. Again, beautiful morning. Took a scenic route. Did not take the highway. Had my classical music playing. And I just needed to be calm driving there. That was very important to me. Um, and like I said, I used all of the practice things that I did during the practice exams, during the actual exam. <sighs> Stayed positive and I got a positive outcome. So I, I definitely think if I just used Dawn's book, I might've missed some things because Phil touched on things that she didn't and vice versa. Um, her book is so much content that Phil just made it realistic. He, he made it, um, uh, uh, um, he just connected it to everyday life. Like, oh yeah, that's a, a great example because I experience that all the time. So I definitely feel like the book and Phil helped me and encouraged me enough to pass this exam so um, I think that's everything Phil <laughs> I just realized that we talked for a minute so yeah no that's okay so if you could give one piece of advice to somebody that is struggling right now to uh -huh. prepare and they don't feel confident what would you tell them one thing remember your reason why just know your why know the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Like for me, it was because I left my job that I knew wasn't going forward to go into that next career that I just wanted to sink my teeth into. So I didn't have 90 days. In my mind, I didn't have 90 days to retake the exam. So I knew what I wanted to do with my career and this license was the last piece of my puzzle. So I just continuously remembered my why. So I would just tell everybody, remember your why, 
speak positive thoughts and just try to move forward. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you coming back. No, of course. Of course. I'm so excited I got to do that. Thank you for allowing me to. Of course. And a lot of people are going to be grateful, myself included, that we got to hear it. Yes. Yes. No problem. And I'll stay on, you know, chat. I see some stuff in the chat room. Again, thanks, Phil. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So anyone else have any other questions? Okay. So what is a realistic amount of time to prepare for this exam? So this is going to be very, very difficult for me to, to decipher and give a time length. So it's going to all depend on your comfort level. And a lot of people will tell you, here's this amount of time that you need to do. Meaning you only have 90 days, you only have 60 days. My time frame is all whatever you're comfortable with. And where does that comfort level going to come from? When you feel like you're bored of studying or burnt out of studying, you may be studying too much or too much at one time. So there's two different continuums. If you are feeling burnt out and you just started studying, you are likely hammering too much information and too much studying at this time. But on the other end, if you've been studying for, let's say, four, five, six months, and you're feeling bored, so you're not motivated to study anymore, you may have overstudied. So my suggestion there would be take a week off, maybe two weeks off of studying, and then come back to the studying and say, what don't I know? And what do I need to focus on right now? Because that two weeks is going to allow one, you to recharge and get your mind back right. Two, you are going to be better for taking that time off and then scheduling your exam and taking it because you've saturated your time so much that you are now not even retaining the stuff and you're bored of it and unmotivated, which could lead to your confidence going down because you aren't focused in doing that anymore. And that's the thing is we see it a lot. You start a behavior, you come heavy, you're doing everything that you want to do, and then you become unmotivated and then you stop doing it. And then time goes by and you look back and say, wow, when was the last time that I felt motivated or excited to do this. And if you're feeling that way, you just have to assess, reflect, and adapt to what is right for you. And you're going to have a lot of people telling you what is right for you. And it's not that people are trying to drag you down or degrade you in any way. It's that people care. But sometimes when people care, they have that ulterior motive for you because they want to see you going further. And that's the thing is, you are the person that knows yourself best. So it's okay to let people in your circle. But if someone's trying to put expectations on you that you don't feel are possible, then let them go and just say, I appreciate the advice, but this isn't going to help me right now. And it's actually making me more stressed. And our goal together is for me to pass the exam. So it all depends on your comfort level. But again, it, it varies from person to person. Those that know my story, I only took two weeks to take the exam. Other people take one, two, three, four, five, up to a year, if not longer to take it. And it's not right or wrong. It's whatever your schedule is and what your life looks like. So that is what I would suggest with what is a subjective term, realistic length of time to get it done. Four, how do you study your research? So that is another tricky one because research is so diverse, but I often tell people to view it like you would clinical practice of what is the objective when you meet with a client for the first time. So it's going to be figure out what you want to figure out. So view it like a client because the first thing in a research study is what do I want to solve or what do I want to look for? And with that, you need to understand what has been done before, aka assessing the client. Like, what have they been through before? What is their presentation? What is their symptoms? What is their supports? What's the strengths? What's the resources available to me to get this job done? And then from there, we need to figure out who's going to be involved. Like, if you're working with a client and they say, I want to get like employment services or I want to get a job, okay. So, have you tried applying for a job before? How would you get there? How will you get the clothing? If you need resources, what resources are available? And then from there, you need to figure out 
is this effective or not? Because if we're doing a research study, the purpose is to test something to see if it is going to sustain progress over time. And beyond that, after, which once we deliver an intervention and in clinical study, we then need to review the results. AKA when you're done working with a client and we've delivered an intervention and they're working towards their goals and we're starting to wind down, was it effective? And if it wasn't effective, what did we miss? What are things and adaptions that we can make? So don't overcomplicate it because there are only three types of, of research that, well, main three main themes. We have our single subject, true experimental, non-experimental, or quasi. So with that single subject, we're going to be, we only have one subject. So allow the title to tell you what it is. Single subject, one person, and they are their own control agent and it's up to them whether the change happens or not. Quasi, think of quasi-moto or an army, because in armies, everyone does the same thing. So in a quasi-experimental, we're all going to be giving the same intervention to everybody because we're not going to admit anyone. So it's very difficult to tell, was this effective or not? Because there are outside factors beyond that. But that's how we differentiate single subject, quasi, and the true experimental. Visualize yourself in a science class back when you were in school and what were we doing we had our nice little lab coats on our goggles on and we we're like if i mix this with this then this result will possibly happen but if i don't mix this with this other component we're going to get a different reaction so again you're going to deliver an intervention to one of the groups and see if it works and in the other group the control group we're not going to give the intervention to that and then see, was there a change? And then is there a difference? So that's how we're going to break down the research in an easy way to break it down. Fifth question. The more I take this exam, the more I visualize myself failing. It's scary, just vulnerable here. So do you want to share your experience right now? Uh, yes. Hello? How is it going? Hi. <laughs> struggling over here um so i took it the first time and i didn't really tell anybody so i went and took it i studied i did all the things i joined a group i watched all your videos um i'm not really much of a reader so i had the dawn book but i didn't really read it i just kind of skimmed through it um but i like i had um like papers and stuff like notes from like other people from the TDC. So I just use them just to kind of like learn the material, but not to take all their tests. I'm really confident, you know, I could do this. I've done this before. This is my line of work. I went in really confident and I missed it by three. Mm -hmm. I was like devastated, cried the whole day. <laughs> it was like the world was over. So months and months and months and months later i sat up sat again to take it so that time i was like okay like i got it i'm confident but if it doesn't play out the way i want it to it's gonna be okay i'm not gonna lose my job i'm still gonna be the same person nothing's gonna change so i was ready for um i was ready to accept whichever direction it went i went missed it by one mm -hmm. so I wasn't upset. I was just like, this is ridiculous. So finally I told my, I told my job. So they allow me to sign up to get the waiver for the 90 days. So now I'm scheduled to go again, but I'm just like, I'm just going to accept the faith of just the fell coming up on the screen. Cause at this point it's just like, like, I know, I know the material but I missed it by one, like what did I miss? What else I need to study? Cause the last time I studied, I felt like there was nothing else for me to study. The day before, I was just like, okay, like I looked at every single thing. So, yeah. So at what point in time do you think your mind's, mindset changed? I, th I think the last exam, because I felt like I did everything. I studied, I watched every single video, I took notes, I attended some of your classes. And at some point I felt like there was nothing else that I was really missing. And I went in like, okay, it's gonna go either I pass or I fell, but I felt like I was gonna more so pass. But if I fell, like it was okay. Like I wasn't gonna like beat myself up like I did the first time. 
So now that I have to take it again, it just feels like I need to, I kind of feel like maybe I need to accept that maybe I am going to fail. Maybe I'll feel better about it. So it won't be so scary. I don't know. So why not think that you can pass? Because when I did last time and I didn't, my whole world was crushed. But you were close. I was close twice. Mm -hmm. So I I feel like I want, one part of me feel like I'm getting closer because when it was three and then now it's one, but it's not the same exam. So I'm like, it's not the same exam, it's different exam. So there's a chance that the next time I go, I might, it might be five. (laughs) With this, you're missing one component. Do you know what that component is? No. It's still the same person. It's a different exam, but it's still the same person with that hungry mindset. And I think this failure has convinced you that you're not that person anymore, but you totally are. That person that was hungry, still intelligent and competent is still there. This exam has just convinced you that you're not. Yeah. So that's the thing is a lot of times people will forget they are that same person with the same wiring in that same process and you were close. So it's like walking over and changing my kitchen sink rather than throwing a dynamite stick in the bottom of my basement and blowing the whole house up because you were close. The structure, the routine, and everything is still on point. You didn't lose anything. Like you said, if you had that mindset, if I pass or fail, I'll be okay. But I think in your mind, you only told yourself that pseudo because you're like, I'm going to pass because I'm going to kick this in the head and I'm not preparing to fail because I don't think that's a possibility for me. And that's where you have to be honest with yourself and say, was I, was I truly okay with failing or did I just say that to make myself feel okay? Because if it did happen, I've said that I'm okay with it. Yeah. And I just, I just like, when I think about this test and I think about me pressing like submit that last thing is just like, it freaks me out. Even when I took it the last time, I took so many breaks because I'm like, okay, I need to like regroup because I can't sit still for a long period of time. I just, I'm not like diagnosed or anything. It's just, some, it's just me. So I get like impatient. So I took breaks I say the information to myself and I come back and I kind of reread it because I want a fresh mind. So I'll reread it um, and then try to answer. I, I didn't flag any questions. La- the first time I went back and like changed a lot of answers, this time I was like, I'm going to just answer whatever comes to mind. Um, and I did that. And then to like see myself pressing submit towards the end, it's just like, it's terrifying. So I'm just like, I, I, I don't know. I'm actually scheduled to test on Friday and I know I'm going to change my ske- my my test date. Why? Well, because of my mindset, I haven't been really like I don't feel confident right now. Like the past couple of days is when I actually like try to pick up the book and I kind of read through the book um cuz I feel, I feel like maybe I was missing a lot of information so I read the book. But I just don't feel like I did the last time, like I have the information in my, in my head. So, so this is going to sound weird, but I need you to do this exact same thing as you did last time. I need okay. you to do the ex- same exact routine. Okay. Because it worked. Yeah, I think, I think it worked too, but I'm like, what happened? <laughs> so, okay. And I'm going to be really, really honest with you because that's just how I am. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. <laughs> Do you think I'm motivated 100% of the time? No, I think you just kind of, I think for everybody, you just kind of push yourself. You have to drag yourself some, some days. It's not going to be like every day. Do you know how long it took for me to upload another YouTube video <laughs> besides this recent one? <laughs> no, how long? 
it took me three weeks in between uploads. Hmm. And in that three weeks, of course, I was doing a lot of other things, but I really didn't think I was touching people's lives. I really didn't. Yeah. I, I was sitting in that moment and I was getting, I'm getting ready to record a video and I'm like, you can't do this anymore. You can't impact people anymore. And that was the yeah. exact thing. And why I'm telling you, you have to do the exact same thing. Because in my recent video, I said, before I was recording, I was like, you're, you're getting in that chair and you're going to say something because these people need you. So every single person in your life needs you to do the exact same thing as you did and expect a different result. <sighs> and it, it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure, but with pressure comes greatness because without pushing in the discomfort and pressing and molding ourselves, nothing extraordinary happens ever. And trust me, it's the, it's the crappiest feeling to do something and not get the result you want. Yeah. But your result in your mind is not what everyone else is seeing. You're not good enough, quote unquote, could be someone's perfection. Like someone could be looking at you and saying, wow, I'm so glad that they're still doing this. Wow, I can't believe they're doing this with all of this wow, I can't believe that they're going back at this as hard as they possibly can. So people are getting motivated by even watching you do what you think is impossible and no one's rocking with you. Yeah, I guess I'm like getting in my head and I don't know, like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. And with that, you may have to take a day off. If you don't feel motivated, just sit back and reflect and say, is this my previous attempt talking to me or is this my current attempt talking to me? It's, yeah, it's all my attempts talking to me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It's, it's okay to, again, not feel motivated and not feel like you're doing enough, but push yourself and still do something and know that you're better for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was hard for me to come up here. <laughs> and, and like I said, I appreciate you, you doing this because there's somebody listening to this that needed to hear that. Yeah, thank you. Of course. And I appreciate everything. And if you need anything, please reach out. But I know you're going to walk in next week more confident and get what you want. Okay. As long as you trust yourself, believe in yourself, and take care of business. Okay, I'm going to start working on believing it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you. You are welcome. Okay, so during my last year and completed my clinical supervision, my father passed away suddenly. I continued to push through and completed all my requirements. However, one adversity after another, I was finally able to take my exam in late May. I took my exam in July, failed by eight points. During the exam... I came across a question that triggered me. And to be honest, I had already been nervous and I believe I shut down after that question. I am scheduled to retake the exam later this month and I'm terrified of this occurring again. Any advice? Of course, of course, of course. So for this, absolutely sorry that that happened to you. And that's a, that's a rough experience and we often don't know what is going to trigger us and what is going to derail us at points in time so with that definitely one take care of yourself two be practicing mindfulness or techniques that you can utilize to de-escalate yourself during the exam and refocus yourself so with this is going to be to develop a routine and ensure you are mentally charged and what does that mean so developing a routine, I often tell people find things within your control during the exam to refocus yourself. Because with this, I fiddle with things 100% of the time. Throughout this thing, I've <laughs> been messing with the fingernail clippers, been moving my hat, been moving a pen. But during my exam, there's a marker next to me. So I had that marker in my hand 100% of the time darn near because I was fiddling it. I was moving it up and down because that is what kept me focused 
And I knew that that was something that was comfortable for me. And that's how I prepared during the exam, actually. Because I always tell people, practice how you're going to perform. Because if you do different things during your prep than you will during the actual exam, it doesn't correlate. And it's almost like an entirely new experience. But if you're reading a question and it brings something up for you, there's no shame in the game to take a couple of seconds to bring yourself in, whether that's taking a couple of deep breaths, whether that's closing your eyes and flexing your shoulders back and then coming forward and then back again and forward, whether that's clenching your fist back and forth, just to bring yourself back into the room and to release any stress in your body. Of course, you're going to have stress stuck in your body, but just to release and process and bring yourself back in the moment rather than outside of the exam room. Because if you're outside of the exam room, it's not going to be helpful for you to be able to pass the exam. And to make sure you're mentally charged, getting that self-care in and not dragging yourself down and burning yourself out throughout your prep. Because a lot of times people will put in hella hours during the prep. They won't retain a lot of things. They feel super tired. They feel burnt out. And then when you walk into the exam room, you aren't 100% you. Because if you're 100% you, you're going to be 100% confident in your abilities to be able to do things with some error and leeway because you're going to be anxious because you care about the exam. But that doesn't mean that we have to be so anxious that it derails you entirely off of the path. So my recommendations, again, develop a routine that is going to be okay with you and for you. And that's going to look different for a lot of people. And ensure you're mentally charged by taking days off during your preparations as well as doing things that you enjoy throughout the prep and throughout the process. And that's something you can take with you in your clinical practice as well. Because you're not going to have easy days 100% of the time. There could be hard days. And if you're burning yourself down and taking clients home with you and et cetera, you're going to need something to unpack that. So developing the routine now is going to be way, way, way pivotal within that. So that is what I would say to that. And again, I'm so sorry for, for what happened to you in that your father suddenly passed away. I'm hoping that you're working through that as well because that's super duper recent and raw. So make sure that you're taking care of yourself so that way you can take care of business and get your licensure. So that is what I would say to that. Is there any tips when going through ethics questions? So very, very difficult to, to speak to again because the code of ethics is very broad and one detail can change everything. So my recommendations per always is to one, understand the question to make sure you know what it's asking and branch through what you know the question is asking. So again, an ethical consideration, that's where we can have ethical dilemmas. Not everyone is going to answer the ethics the same way. But knowing the basis of what the common themes are, we're seeing dual relationships, we're seeing conflicts of interest, we're seeing confidentiality, we're seeing bartering, we're seeing what is our duty to our colleagues, what is our duty to our profession, what is our duty to our clients, and when can we disclose things, when should we not disclose things, etc. Duty to warn and all of those things. So keeping those bases down and letting it roll. So that is the thing is when you don't have the, the knowledge of the code of ethics or intricacies of that or trying to rush through a question, it's going to be very difficult to get it correct. So my tip is take your time and understand the question and understand why each answer is incorrect and why the single answer, single choice is the answer. Because again, a lot of times people will read the question and try to dictate what the answer is prior to even reading the entire question. Not a good move because the answer is on the page for a reason and you need to think through what the question is actually asking you before answering. But a lot of times people feel like they're in a hurry and they're rushing because they feel they're going to run out of time and then they have extra time at the end of the exam and say, well, crap, maybe if I would have took X amount of time, I would have maybe passed the exam. Again, it's not to say that you would have, but again, if you're rushing, most times when you feel rushed, so think about if you're supposed to go to an event and somebody that is going to the event with you is rushing you 
100% of the time it's like, all right, we need to get there. We need to get there. We need to get there. And you're like, okay, I can't even think straight. I need to make sure I have everything I need for this event. And they're like, it doesn't matter. We need to get it there. We and it's just like, stop. Take a breath, figure out what it's asking me. What do I need to do? And then get it done. And again, that's going to look different for other people. Some people can look at questions, cut them in half, get the answer way quicker than other people. But knowing yourself is going to be pivotal in the process of passing. So do you recommend studying the morning of the exam? It all depends. Personally, what I did is I got to the exam site one hour early. So that way there was no risk of traffic. And that I, if anything happened, I would still be able to get to the exam site. And then what I did was skim the code of ethics. So that way I would have the basis of what the standards are. But I was more or less just listening to music while the code of ethics was in my lap and my eyes were looking at the page, but I was more or less reining in what I had known that I was going to do, going through my routine, making sure that I knew that I wanted to do and what I needed to say. So what I recommend studying the morning of the exam, it all depends on your personality. If you're somebody that feels like they need to be doing something 100% of the time, I would Maybe you read a question or two, break it down just to make sure you still have the routine fresh in your head. But I wouldn't overspill, meaning I wouldn't do way too much to sway you off or exhaust you because it's going to be four hours and four hours of focusing. It's pretty exhausting for some people. So knowing yourself and walking through that process is going to be very, very important. So if you're somebody that doesn't feel like you need to be doing something 100% of the time, I would still recommend skimming the code of ethics, not over exerting yourself, but still picking out the themes, making sure they're fresh in your head, and then going from there.